everyone have one of the one-page handouts for today? Yes, that looks like the right one, apparently. Father, Father Jones doesn't have one, though. And I want him to have a handout. You're welcome, sir. It's, um, I'm going to give you all, I'm going to give you all the answers to the exam, Sam, you know, as part of our special learning program. Uh, <laughs> Story, did you need a handout? Okay, good. All right, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh, Almighty God, who pours out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication, deliver us when we draw nigh to Thee from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may study and worship Thee in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the second session in our examination of uh, the theology of Richard Hooker, and the <clears throat> his classic work, The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. Now, just by way of review, for those of you who weren't here last week, or for those of you watching at home, who is Richard Hooker and why do we care in the 21st century about him? He's a 16th century priest in the Church of England who begins his career in um, a largely sort of academic parish, the temple, the lawyer's parish in London. Um, harsh basic training for a young preacher and scholar. And he eventually is released from that assignment and goes to a parish, a quiet parish, to which he can turn his attention and draft what's come to be called the laws of ecclesiastical polity a robust defense of the Anglican way, the way of being Christian that was um, in practice in the Church of England at that time. But um, why do we care? Why, why do we study this person? Well, some of the commentators would disagree with me, but um, if Calvinism has Calvin and Lutheranism has Luther, I would propose to you that Hooker, Richard Hooker, the learned and judicious Hooker himself, is the closest thing we have to a figure of that magnitude in our tradition. Thomas Cranmer and Henry, the, Henry VIII are dead. Henry's occasional writings are anything but systematic. Some say they're inconsistent, and they would not be wrong when they say that. Um, the second generation, Edward VI and... Uh, John Jewell and Ridley and Latimer and the other Anglican divines of the early Reformation, dead either through execution or natural causes later down the road. Mary Tudor, dead and buried. Elizabeth I, Elizabeth uh, for now the Great, um, is reigning. And through the Elizabethan settlement, we have uniform worship and Elizabeth as the supreme governor of the Church of England. Now, this is Washington, D.C., so I'm going to look for a historical and political comparison or metaphor. I would suggest to you that Hooker's laws of ecclesiastical polity are to Anglicanism what the Federalist Papers are to our American Constitution and way of government. They are a second-generation attempt not necessarily at polemics, not at apologetics, not at you got to believe me or I'm going to be really angry type of persuasion, but instead a learned and deliberate and systematic exposition of why Anglicanism. 
why Anglicanism stands as a way of being Christian in the 16th century and its logic and um, comprehensive nature make it still relevant today because truth be told, Richard Hooker is more commonly cited than read and more commonly read than understood. And this class is an effort to um, give you a digestible package of Hooker and whet your appetite to study him in greater depth down the road. Because I suggest, and here's the big why, that many of the issues that confronted Hooker and the 16th century Anglican Church are the same issues that we confront as Anglican Orthodoxy today. Threats from the Radical Reformation, threats from Latin Christianity, threats from latitudinarianism, anything goes type of progressive attitude. All these challenges to Anglican Christianity still exist. And I think if we were a little bit more familiar with what Hooker offered as justification for Anglicanism in that second generation of the English Reformation, we may be better prepared whether we encounter his name on social media or in a more learned uh, discussion offline. Uh, we're better prepared to articulate why it is we think the Anglican way of being a Christian is a good one. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at um, Hooker the Man and uh, <clears throat> dipped our toe in the water to chapters one through four of what I consider and what many consider to be the most important book, the distilled essence of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. Book five of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. Um, chapters one through four are summarized in the top part of your handout. And there's really basically two points I'd like you to take away from this. First of all, Hooker is an optimistic writer. He's an optimistic scholar. He assumes the best about opponents in a way that perhaps John Jewell and later Cramner did not. He has breathing room. He can do that. Not the hothouse of apologetics that either Cramner or even Jewell were writing in. But take a look at paragraph 1a. In support of his assertion that it is good for the state to cultivate religious belief in the populace, he suggests that actually everybody has the same goal. All the different parties that are jockeying for position in the Reformation English church, actually all of them want to have such laws and ordinances in the church as may best serve to abolish superstition and establish the worship of God in a perfect or more perfect form. And he would go further and say that the individual obligation that everyone is seeking to worship God, to obey him, is the same as far as the inner person. But where the parties differ, most profoundly, Hooker suggests, is in outer solemn worship and service. Um, the liturgy, the worship embodied in the Book of Common Prayer is the source of our present disagreements, he says, then and maybe now. And the reason for this disagreement is the Puritans, those who sought to purify the Church of England even more than had been done under Cranmer, under Elizabeth, and but to continue the reformation of the church, assert in Hooker's assessment that the Book of Common Prayer and the liturgies in it, the worship practices, are filled with false uh, falsehoods and stained with superstition. The text I'm using in this handout comes from Mr. Secor, Dr. Secor's modernized English version of Book Five, um, but it is um, a good modernization. Um, it is not modularized in any way. Um, it is um, 
It captures the essence of Hooker's concern and the Puritan argument. Hooker emulates one of his uh, academic inspirations in this regard. Thomas Aquinas would always introduce his opponent's view in a reasoned and deliberate way before he turned said contra to what the church taught about a particular position. And Hooker in chapters one through four largely does the same thing. So in the chapters that we're gonna to consider today, Hooker is talking about worship. Chapters five through 10 of book five are primarily about what we do in the sanctuary and nave in every one of our worship services. And again, he starts ironically by saying, in all forms of worship, the glory of God and the edification and spiritual well-being of his people is to be sought. Nothing should be done in worship that is performed in an indecent and disorderly manner. Hooker says about this, all the parties agree. Whether they're within the Church of England or without, they're seeking a decent, orderly, edifying worship of God. But then Hooker highlights three key criticisms of the Puritans. First, that they should avoid conformity with the Church of Rome. And by conformity, the Puritans varied by what they meant with this, but um, the artifacts of medieval worship that are still practiced in the Reformation liturgy are objectionable to many, if not all, Puritans. Um, who can think of some examples of um, conformity with the Church of Rome that the Puritans might object to, realizing that our liturgy today is very similar to the liturgy in the 1559 prayer book that was in effect at the time? Anybody? Kent? Uh, Sean? Decorations uh, for either Christmas, particularly a, a bone of contention, but also just um, adornment within the chapels themselves. Uh, Kent, did you have anything else? Just the, the long table, the long table, the table with flowers, and with, uh, candles, crosses, crosses alike, exactly. Vestments. vestments were objectionable to some. Exactly. Anybody else? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, or representations of any sort. Yeah, some even objected to stained glass windows at the time. Uh, right. Uh, the, the muscular nature of uh, Anglican worship. Um, it's particularly kneeling during the receipt of communion. Uh, Father Jones. Yeah. Uh, and not only the ring and the signing of the cross um, during baptism and elsewhere, but the, the entire liturgical apparatus around them to some was objectionable. Um, uh, why be married in the church even? I mean, it, it became issues. Um, the significance of one day versus another for Puritans was something about which they argued and said was a medieval artifact. Uh, Kent. Anything directed towards the uh, admiration of the saints, whether it be Saints Day or Saints Day? Right. I'm not sure. But, uh, and then um, prayer, the occasion of the saints. Kent says that uh, the, the saints generally um, were problematic for the Puritans, and I think that's accurate, particularly in the observances of the medieval church to the extent that they had survived in the rather pared down calendar. Um, and um, Cranmer and the next generation had done a very good job with the 1552-59 prayer book of eliminating prayers to the saints <clears throat> or for the dead, <clears throat> but there were still vestiges, right, purifying. So the Puritans sought that the church should avoid conformity with the Church of Rome and further purify the church's worship. Second, that the many Puritans said that the church should avoid or not utilize any rites 
that were not expressly commanded, required by Scripture, um, by God through Scripture, and um, were, they were therefore abusive devices that um, led to superstition. Um, in some forms, this is referred to as a regulative principle of Scripture, that the church should not do, cannot do, that which is not required by Scripture. We'll see how Hooker sort of turns that notion on its head uh, in a, just a moment. And then finally, and I, I think this might be Hooker um, being a little polemical, but he says the Puritans seek to impose um, a Calvinistic Geneva-style worship on Anglicans uh, in the Church of England, that Calvin's church in Geneva should be the pattern of all other Reformed churches. If you look at the order of worship for Calvin's churches uh, devised in 1542 and compare it to the Reformation liturgy, it's pretty close. <laughs> um, Calvin introduces uh, metrical psalm singing. Uh, he introduces extemporaneous prayer, and he objects to fixed prayers. But there's a lot of similarity here, and I can't help but wonder if um, either Hooker's stretching to make a point, or if the Calvinists who are arguing in beha in, on behalf of a Geneva-style worship haven't really looked at the Book of Common Prayer and compared it to the way Genevan Calvinists are, are worshiping. That's the stage. Hooker responds with five propositions. Chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are really five propositions um, in response to the Puritan argument. This is one of the confusing things about Hooker. Hooker will state his opponent's argument, but not let the opponent's statement of argument control his answer. And while he says the Puritans have three objections, he gives five responses, and they don't line up perfectly. So bear with me as I try to um, synthesize Hooker's response to the three Puritan objections that he cited previously. But Proposition 1 is pretty simple. It says that the goal of Anglican worship, the prayer book Christianity, is to advance in godliness. And he proposes that those practices that are apparently fit to advance godliness and can be generally demonstrated to do so <clears throat> by a means that we're going to explore shortly, uh, may be reverently entertained, notwithstanding some few rare and tolerable inconveniences. So the church has discretion to pursue godliness in its worship. This is not the regulative principle. This is an expansive interpretation of the church's mission to worship God. Proposition two is similar. The argument that we've always done it that way, that a practice is medieval in origin or patristic in origin, dating back to the apostles, does not make it inappropriate for inclusion in present day liturgies. In other words, we need not discard everything that went before where it's not immediately apparent nor easy to demonstrate why certain religious practices are inappropriate, we, the church, may lead people to think these religious rites of ours are at least not unsuitable, and that we do so by reference to the judgment of history, as long as our opponents are unable to show any significant inconvenience in observing them or strong objections to them, strong reading persuasive objections to them. More about that concept in a minute. I think these first two propositions are dedicated to objection number one that um, Hooker attributes to the Puritans, that the Anglican worship uses Catholic artifacts. And he says, that's okay. If it advances godliness, and um, notwithstanding the fact that it's the way the Catholic Church did it, and other Christians 
before the Reformation. <clears throat> yeah, the online satire of Protestant belief is that the church went off the rails in AD 33 and returned to forward movement in 1517 or thereabouts in Wittenberg with Luther's uh, commencement of the Reformation. You can place the date and place differently, but um, Hooker is articulating the position that becomes the standard Anglican position that no, we can learn and emulate the church fathers, patristic practices, even medieval practices, as long as they advance godliness. And not only advance it, but are apparently fit to advance godliness. The next point is um, perhaps the most important point we're going to cover today, because in chapter 8, Hooker introduces a concept and a way of evaluating whether things advance in godliness and whether the legacy of history is enough to justify something going forward. He introduces a method of examining these practices that has mutated and taken on an entirely new form and energy in today's world. And if you visit Twitter or other forms of social media, uh, you uh, may recognize this methodology, um, although you won't necessarily uh, see it as uh, phrased identically to what you encounter online. But chapter 8 is still with us today. And if you read one chapter in these chapters for this week, I commend chapter 8 to you. In chapter 8, Hooker proposes that where there is neither evidence of any divine law nor the strength of any invincible contrary argument discovered by reason nor any notable public inconvenience caused by ecclesiastical laws, even if they're brand new, bolded in your handout, then the authority of the church alone is sufficient to order services of worship and related practices. I want to unpack that in a form that might be, number one, more readily understandable and is more commonly encountered in today's rhetorical environment. The first part concerning Scripture. In all such matters, whatever Scripture clearly sets forth has first priority, both as to authority and required obedience. This is a nod to the regulative principle. Hooker says, if Scripture does require it, or is the practice is necessary by way of implication from Scripture, that has first priority, both as to authority and obedience. So he starts with Scripture. Hooker is a Protestant. He starts with the text and requirements of Scripture. But notice what he puts in second place. He says, in second place is the force of human reason and whatever it may determine. Now, there have been entire books written by what Richard Hooker means when he says reason. And indeed, the entire eight books of the laws of ecclesiastical polity involve discussion of this, what does he mean by reason? But for this purpose here, I think that reason means reason as applied to Scripture and, as we'll see, to the decisions and uh, practices of the church. We are not unthinking. We are not, um, I hesitate to use this term, uh, fundamentalist in the sense that we are going to exclude any examination or analysis of what Scripture requires. We don't either foreclose or pre-decide issues that are raised by Scripture but are not clearly set forth. And then finally, whatever the church by her ecclesiastical authority and in harmony with reason thinks and defines as true and good will overrule all lesser judgments. Scripture reason, tradition. Anybody recognize that 
triad, that trilogy. The so-called Anglican or hooker's stool, exactly. Um, if you get nothing else out of today's class, never say hooker's or Anglican stool. It is, that is not a stool by the plain text and description. The capstone, the cornerstone, the foundation, whichever metaphor you want to choose is scripture. And Hooker, um, I, I think the close, if he were to choose a, um, a metaphor, I think it would be a pyramid of some sort, but it would not be a stool that implies that these three things are somehow equal because the longest leg in the stool, the most solid foundation is scripture. And whatever scripture clearly sets forth has first priority. So uh, it is not a three-legged anything. It is a conceptual foundation grounded in scripture that examines practices in light of scripture using reason and to make decisions within the church. And here we begin to see a little bit more about what, script, what Hooker means by reason. He doesn't mean private judgment. All three of these are important. They're just not equally important. I think of the way that Augustine describes the Trinity. Augustine describes the Trinity as grounded in the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the love that is passed between the Father and Son and which overflows into the church and to his elect people and the city of God. In a similar way, I think we can view Scripture and the church as the poles of Hooker's analysis and reason the, the means by which those two poles are held together. The church uses reason to examine scripture to determine what's required in scripture. Likewise, believers and the church can look at scripture and examine critically sometimes, but other times to determine a way forward what the church is doing. And in this way, we don't have a, a stool. We have more of an organic, um, interactive way of being the worshiping church. And I really want to emphasize this point because if you've encountered the three-legged stool, either on the internet or in arguments at the water cooler at school or in Bible studies, you know that many people try to apply this to everything, to doctrine to uh, fundamentals of the faith, to scriptural interpretation, and the like. But Hooker is very clear about what he sees this for. Remember where this is. He's talking about worship. He's talking about worship here. And I want to read his um, traditional English so that you, you, there's no way you can misunderstand what he's saying here, even though it's in Elizabethan English. We therefore crave, thirdly, to have it granted that where neither the evidence of any law divine nor the strength of any invincible argument otherwise found out by light of reason nor any notable public inconvenience doth make against that which our own laws ecclesiastical have although but newly instituted for the ordering of these affairs. Okay, that's his throat clearing. The very authority of the church itself at least in such cases, may give so much credit to her own laws. I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong highlighted paragraph. There we go. It is not for a man which doth know or should know what order is and what peaceable government required to ask, why should we hang our judgment on the church's sleeve and why in matters of order more than in matters of doctrine? The church hath authority to establish that for an order at one time, which at another time it may abolish, and both it may do well. And here's the key point. 
But that which in doctrine the church doth now deliver rightly as a truth, no man will say that it may hereafter recall and as rightly avouch the contrary. Laws touching matter of order, that is worship, are changeable by the power of the church. Articles concerning doctrine, not so. So the so-called Anglican stool that's invoked by progressives, Anglo-Catholics, evangelicals, latitudinarians, almost everybody has at one time or another invoked the um, hooker's stool uh, in defense of doctrinal change. And it is not for doctrinal change. It is to evaluate the church's order and practices in worship. The um, last two propositions are um, minor in compared to what's gone before. Hooker suggests in Proposition 4 that notwithstanding all this, that the church has the flexibility to waive the application of certain good laws rather than bind everyone strictly and inflexibly to them. The church can, in discretion, allow variety in ceremonies and rituals and the like. And then finally, Proposition 5. Not all opinions in the church are created equal. Hooker suggests that the church applies a strong presumption that people who come forward and suggest that uh, there are private revelations to be had about how the church should worship, how the church should order itself, we see a strong presumption that God has not, in fact, spoken to the hearts of those who make such claims because he's not given them the ability to prove their assertions. So if you claim private judgment, if you claim that you've got a better way to worship than the church has decided, Hooker suggests that unless like the, um, the approach suggested by, uh, in, to the Sanhedrin in Scripture, well, if it's of God, it will work, and if it's not, it won't, uh, is, is a good method of evaluating the Puritan claims. If they were meant to persuade us, they would persuade their bishops. The bishops are godly men. The parliament is serving the supreme governor of the church still at this point. Um, the presumption is that if they cannot claim a persuasion of the bishops, the, the leadership of the church and the king's parliament then and the king in parliament, then it's not to be given weight. You can't just go and implement that in your local parish. I conclude with a sort of um, extreme summary of what Hooker has attempted to do in chapters 5 through 10. But I reiterate it because I think it's really important in light of chapter 8 to realize that he is talking about its forms of worship. This is Hooker setting the stage for the many chapters that we'll study this fall about the particulars of worship, why we sing, why we read scripture, why we listen to sermons, why we have communion so frequently and otherwise. I, um, it is not talking about development of doctrine. It is not talking about doctrinal reformation. The book five of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity is talking about the church's worship, why we do what we do when we come together to worship God. Now, we have some time left, and I want to uh, open it to questions, because I see some scrunched eyebrows and the like, but uh, see some arm spasms and uh, preliminary gestures at the uh, questioning. So. Anybody have any thoughts, comments, or concerns about what I've shared about these chapters in Book 5 of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity? Kent? Kent?
Absolutely. Ken points out that, um, or suggests that Hooker's distinction between doctrinal beliefs, um, assertions of the church and its worship cannot be so cleanly divided, that changes in worship can reflect changes in doctrinal perspective, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Anybody have any other thoughts on what Kent has observed? Because that's something we still wrestle with, with doctrinal change. The Catholic Church still wrestling with it. It's not a clean line. But I think what Hooker is setting up here in chapters 5 through 10 is um, a way of resolving doubts in that matter. And what the church is entrusted to do with the aid of the Holy Spirit is to make those calls. Right. He is. Yeah. That, that's an example of this sort of doctrinal thing. I think you're right, as we already said. There is a fuzziness, right, in terms of uh, sort of the middle ground of okay, you're changing the, the, the rights of the church to preach. And he's saying the church can change. You can they don't. But he's really guarding against that thing that's happened all the time now, which is people will use this thing, they atomize it out, and say, well, okay, let's, let's do this analysis thing. He is, and, and that the church ultimately is the change manager. And remember who he's writing to or against. He's writing against Puritans who want a governance not by bishops necessarily, although some do, are willing to, some are bishops, <laughs> many are bishops at this stage, um, but they want presbyteral governance. They want a congregation to be able to make these changes. They want the freedom of the faith to exist at the congregational level under the governance of presbyters 
hence the name Presbyterian, which is applied to many of the Puritans in their sort of fully blossomed form in the 17th century. Um, any other points or observations about uh, the three-legged stool that isn't? Uh, Josiah? Right. 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 Westminster. You know, um, something that, um, speaking of the articles, and I'll close with this point, um, the um, Article 34 of the Articles of Religion does address this um, to a certain extent. And it says, every particular or national church has authority to ordain, change, abolish ceremonies or rites of the church ordained only by man's authority so that all things be done to edifying. So there's that authority of the the, the particular or national church to make liturgical change. But then significantly, it says, whosoever through his private judgment willingly and purposely doth openly break the traditions and ceremonies of the church, that is, those that have been decided through the application of scripture and reason and the church's decision making, which not be repugnant to the word of God and be ordained and approved by common authority, ought to be rebuked openly that others may fear to do the like, as he that offendeth against the common order of the church and hurts the authority of the magistrate and wounds the consciences of weak brethren. So um, the articles are sort of fresh off the press by the time Hooker is writing this, so he may not be invoking it, but he's certainly, the spirit is the same. The church is the decision maker about its liturgy, it does so through the application of human reason and by reference ulti as ultimate authority to Scripture, but it does have the authority to determine and change its forms of worship. Why do I close on this point? Why does Hooker make a point before he jumps off into details? Because if you're like me, you love the Book of Common Prayer. And as an Anglican Christian, we love the way we worship. But even a prayer book, even a way of worship can become an idol. <laughs> we should not be liturgical fundamentalists. And Hooker is saying that there is a danger in both ways that we face from medieval Catholicism and we face from those who would discard the valid parts of medieval worship that the church is seeking to preserve. So Hooker is fending off fundamentalists left and right, <laughs> up and down, um, and trying to preserve what eventually becomes called a via media, a middle way, uh, in a universe that tends to extremes. And the gravity, the anchor that Hooker turns to is scripture, as applied by the church in its worship. So I do want to stop there because we're at past 1215. And I will stay after for questions, of course. And next week, we're going to pick up on some uh, subsequent chapters. I think you and me, you're up. Father Jones will be up. But um, if you don't already have it, um, there are used copies of this um, version by Dr. Secor, S-E-C-O-R, that are available online, bookfinder.com, others, not an endorsement, just a mention, um, uh, gettextbooks.com, uh, Amazon. They're, they're available all over the place. And also the book that we'll be reading in book group, which is a sort of topical assembly of these 
hookerisms. Um, it's a shame that another vocation has already claimed the nickname of hookers, but um, you know we, we are. In a matter <laughs> so. Father Jones, could I ask you to close us with prayer? Um, and please fill us uh, with love for you and for one another, that as we work, as we um, spend time with our loved ones, and um, as we do all the things that you've called us to do this week, that you might lead us by your spirit, that we might bring glory to you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.